come with us now, if you dare, down a rickety staircase into a dank, dark basement. What awaits the Saturday Night Freak Show? <laughs> hey, thanks for listening to the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast. It's a movie book club, kind of, where somebody picks a movie round robin every week, and then we sit around and talk about it for your listening pleasure hey do us a favor wherever you find us going over to uh what is it itunes stitcher pod if i <laughs> spot uh, what it being and uh give us a like a star rating or a review all of that stuff helps us get found by other like-minded folks like you and we want to meet you all so uh join the freak show fan club the freak show family uh wherever you found us so these are the internet radio superstars Holly. Sean. Michaela. And I'm Colin. And tonight we watched the movie that was chosen by. Who was it chosen by? Michaela. I'm sorry. I wasn't wasn't, wasn't here last week, so I have no idea where we're at. (laughs) Michaela chose it tonight. Michaela, what did we watch? Well, we're on the final stop of our summer blockbuster failure event. And I truly believe I saved the best for last with Dread 2012. 2012. Was this a failure? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, big time financial failure. Big yeah. time. But it has a cult uh, reputation now where a lot of people found it on home video after the fact. So now Absolutely. there is like a the cult of dread. Uh who directed this movie? Uh technically Pete Travis is credited as directing. What does that mean? Uh Later on, Carl Urban basically said, hey, Alex Garland stepped in like halfway through and directed it because Pete Travis was having so many disagreements with the studio. So who's uh, Alex Garland? Uh, He wrote this movie and he wrote a bunch of other movies that we like or have. I don't don't know. I shouldn't speak for all of us when I say like, but uh, Ex Machina, Annihilation. Well, those um, are the two he directed. Thinking, there's a bunch more. <laughs> yeah, he also wrote, uh, well, he wrote, wrote a lot of stuff with Danny Boyle because he wrote the novel that The Beach was based on. So he became like right. this kind of Gen X, uh, you know, um, author for The Beach, which was made into a movie, Danny Boyle. Danny Boyle also employed him to write uh, 28 Days Later and right. um, Sunshine. Sunshine. Yep. Mm-hmm. And so then he got his, uh, and then he wrote this, not for Danny Boyle, and then got his directorial directorial debut with Ex Machina, which then, uh, you know, if you haven't seen that movie, you should check it out, because nominated for Best Screenplay. Won an Academy Award for uh, Special Effects, um, which was quite an upset that year, considering who they were up against. I forgot who they were up against, but they were not expected to win. Yeah. It's a great Oscar Isaac performance. Yeah, mm-hmm. and introduced a lot of people to Alicia Vikander also. And yes. we're like, what happened to her after Laura Croft, after she was a Tomb Raider? Like, she dropped off the map, but hey, at least she got, she, you know, our big budget. She married Michael Fassbender. I wouldn't be doing shit oh, if I was married yeah. to him either. Did she marry Fassbender? Yeah. Yeah. Damn. I'd be, okay. I'd be sitting back being Mrs. Fassbender, too. <laughs> yeah, get it, girl. <laughs> uh, who else was in uh, Ex Machina? Domhnall Hall Gleeson. Donald Gleeson. Yeah. Donal. How do you say it? Donal? Donal Gleason? Donal. Yes, yep. Donal. That's right. Who Alex Garland took over from this movie. I assume he's in uh, Dread. Um, mm-hmm. you, you all know him from the Star Wars films, right? Is that what we're saying that they know? Peter Rabbit. <laughs> Definitely Peter Rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> Which, not going to lie, pretty good movie. I mean, Probably. he's... he's- He's pretty well known for lots of movies. He's also in the Harry Potter movies. Yeah, like he's been I'm pretty sure he's in those. Yeah, yeah, sure. he's been in a lot of stuff. Who was he in the Harry Potter movies? One of he the was the, kids. the oldest Weasley brother. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. It wasn't Bill? Was it? Was it Bill? Is it Bill? It's he's the one that marries Flora Delcor. I think it's Bill. I think, it's I Bill. think so. Because okay. Percy's the uptight. Well, no matter what we one. say, we're gonna have Harry Potter people coming after. I know. I know I'd... we are. So. <laughs> Well, I'm not great with Harry Potter. I like it, but I'm not a fanatic. So. That fandom is toxic. So yeah, <laughs> this movie uh, Dread is not to be confused with the Clive Barker movie Dread with the uh, D R E A D. Uh, this is D R E D D. Of course, you know that if you clicked on this podcast, this is a um, adaptation of the Judge Dread comic character. Michaela, what do you know about Judge Dread? 
Um, not much other than there was a Stallone movie in the nineties and he never takes his helmet off. Well, he does in the Stallone movie, unfortunately. Well, I know. Yeah. That movie was famous for breaking the rules of the comic that were established that the judges are never supposed to take their helmet off. Yeah. Well, this is a thing that happens. Uh, I was actually going to, as I was watching this movie, I was going to ask you guys, um, because most superhero comic book characters have some kind of, you know, mask, that either covers the f- top half of their face and their eyes or it covers the bottom half of their face and their mouth. And generally, we always see that character without, you know, taking its mask off. We just, You know who's in there. The Judge Dredd comics, it's a, it was an English uh, character in a comic magazine called 2000 AD, which came out, I believe, in the 80s is when it started. I don't think it was the 70s. I think it was the 80s. Um, but he, yeah, that was the thing. It's judge dread is the mask is his face, right? But when you're watching this movie, cause this is one of the only movies I think that I can think of, of a comic book character where they commit to the idea. It's like, no, we're not taking the fucking mask off. That is the character. Um, did you miss seeing, uh, did you miss Carl urban? Um, you know, cause you couldn't see yeah. his eyes. He's doing yeah, no. he's doing good. Can you imagine I mean, him <laughs> Judge Dredd waking up in the morning, out of bed, he just sits up, helmet, goes <laughs> to make his cup of coffee, just sitting there in nothing, just boxer shorts. I feel like coffee, that would, I feel like that would be like a, a Family Guy bit. Just have him like brushing his teeth with his helmet it's on. Got, like it's gotta be. I right? like to imagine when he sits up in bed, there's like this Rube Gold, Goldberg machine that comes down and puts his helmet on his head for him. <laughs> Yeah, this is going <laughs> like to be a like Darth and Gromit type situation. Or Darth Vader. I was, I was thinking, I was thinking of like, yeah, like I was thinking of like V for Vendetta. He's always wearing his mask, and we don't. Oh see yeah, him that was another mask. one. That and committed. I'm, yeah, that was the first one that came to my mind. They're like we never see, and I'm fine with that. I don't need to see his face. And but isn't that also, because he's horribly scarred? Yeah, but I just mean, the idea that you're is, never going to see an actor, you know, they always usually at some point yeah. Deadpool has to take his mask off. Spider-Man's running around most yeah. of his movie with his mask off and famously Judge Dredd in, in the Judge Dredd movie with Stallone barely wears the goddamn helmet, it seems. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but you got to imagine this is like a nightmare for a studio, right? Because you want to cast someone famous to help sell the movie but then the audience is never actually going to see that famous person. So what does it matter? Right. How did they cast this movie? Just I have no idea. Just, <laughs> what's your bottom lip look like if you're scowling? Yeah. Well, there's I, a whole lot of scowling as, going on. As the movie goes on, it gets hard to tell them apart even. Yeah, it does. Well, that's what I was saying. I was looking at the badges cause they, they all have name tags, but uh, you know, in the shadows and all that, you can't actually really tell. Um, you know, but I was trying to figure out like, okay, who am I looking at right now when the other judges showed up? Um, I think it is kind of, I don't know. Is it a brave thing when an actor says, you know, because usually I assume some of that has to do with audience identification. The studio says you got to take the mask off so I can actually see, you know, I can relate to the, the person if I can see their face, or at least it has to be expressive. I suppose that's the new CGI enhanced Spider-Man it gives you, you know, expressive yeah. mask eyes and stuff like that. Or is there like, a, is it a brave choice for an actor who says, okay, so I'm going to be the star in this movie, but you're never going to see my face the whole way I mean, through. Bane, Bane never took the mask off in the Dark Knight Rises. Yeah. And that was after this. Um, uh, I care until they put the mask on. But, you know, I mean, is it any different than, like, uh, you know, Thanos? I, I mean, you it. never see uh, Josh Brolin, you know, in, in the Avengers movies. That's fine. Well, I mean, that's, re- a, that's different, though. Like, we see the character that we're supposed to see. It's not like we're, it's not like his face is covered. He's not wearing a Thanos mask. No, like, but I mean. That's the Thanos we're supposed to see. Right. But, but I don't, like, that's what I was wondering. I was like, is it that the character doesn't really have like he's a very robotic character in this like we don't have a lot of emotion from him anyway is it the character or is it the fact that it's carl urban like i don't i i feel like it's kind of both like the character i'm like i don't really need to see his face i'm not really relating to him in any way and also i'm not that attached to carl urban so i don't really care i mean yeah yeah, he's supposed to be a soulless executor of the law so like i don't think emotion's really that important right yeah 
Yeah, and it's and, you know I like Carl Urban, but I'm not going to go see a movie just because of Carl Urban. Right. You know, like right, his like face on the poster is not going to yeah uh, he's, he's, draw he's me done in some... that much. Exactly. If I, but if I hear though that they have like he because I he was really up for never taking the mask off. I remember that from um, hearing the production stories about this. Mm-hmm. Um, the fact that they don't like I I respect that he decided to do that, to stick with the mask the entire way. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I will, I will give Carl Urban major props. Like he's, you know, we've got him in Lord of the Rings, the Marvel universe, the Star Trek universe, like homeboy's done some shit. Like, yeah, I like him, but he's not a star. He doesn't have any star power for me. Well, I think it's, you know, I mean, as an actor, I think a lot of you, you know, you're very self-conscious about how you look, you know, obviously. And, and the idea that, uh, you know, the, whatever part that you're playing right now gives you the, opportunity to play something in the future and you're hoping that you know executives or directors or whatever when they see you you know will go like oh he did you know i'm watching his face and the emotion coming through and all that so that's what i'm saying like it is kind of um i mean i respect him for taking that choice and going like you know what keeping the helmet on the whole time because the character is the helmet (laughs) you know (laughs) so we're just gonna wear this 100 percent the whole way and uh just trust that like well, I'm Carl Urban at this point, and, you know, I probably will do other stuff, you know. I mean, he'd been in those Riddick movies, and he survived that. So. Plus, this could help. I mean, well, yeah. It could help. It's just like, well, then he's just, he's dread. Like, yeah. he's yeah. that helmet on or anything. Like, they, they, the famous actor doesn't, um, it's not an obstacle they have to overcome. He's just dread, mm-hmm. which is great. Yeah. Yeah. Allegedly, he kept it on even like between takes, just walking around <laughs> on set and stuff. And I was like, yep. "Perfect." He just that's, that's walking commitment. around, going, I, "I am the law. Like, I, am, yeah. I am the law. I am the law." It's, it's, it's not necessary. <laughs> that's a so little did, call back there. What, what was is it? Is it just me or did his mouth just never change? He was like this the whole movie. Yeah, he was doing yeah, a, a pretty hard well, sneer there. I'm yeah, like, wow! Well, like, I just did it for like three seconds. I'm just like, wow, that's some tires. Yeah, there was a there was a scene that like they were on his face for quite some time, and he held that sneer. I was like, dude, that, his face has to be sore. I know. I you think at some point you're going to get a cramp. This movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you, like, think, do you think he got facial massages between takes? I hope somebody hired somebody for him. <laughs> we should have checked the credits. Facial <laughs> massagist. So what's After this? day one, they're like, yeah, we're going to have to bring someone in. <laughs> well, I know this movie takes place in the future. I think it actually did at some point tell us what year it was. I missed it. I'm sorry, but it's the the far-flung future, right? Mm. Where uh, A cobra future. It's the summer. Is this what? I've done a lot of future movies this summer. Yeah. Yep. The dystopian future world of, a lot of uh, movies this summer. <laughs> I think all of them have been. Well, yeah. there there has well, been yeah, a, steel some of the future too. There's been an ar- in a some kind of like uh, World War. This is post World War Three, I assume, because like most of the Earth has been irradiated and turned to a desert. But there's these gigantic mega cities where eight million people live uh, in one uh, on the ruins of the old world. We're told at the beginning of the movie, um, which eighty are, million people, eighty yeah, million. Sorry, lot. like that. That's right. Mm-hmm. So they're stacked up on each other in these mega blocks, which are uh, apartment buildings, like gigantic apartment buildings. Um, well, before we even get into this, I mean, how many of you are familiar with the Sylvester Stallone take on this character? Yeah. Me. Yeah. I'm very it's familiar. Did you just movie. watch it? What? Did you just watch it? No, I've been watching the the Sylvester Stallone Judge Dredd for like <laughs> all my life. Oh, okay. I haven't seen it in a while, and I was gonna watch it in preparation for this, but the story is so different, so different that I didn't know how relevant it would be. They are all over the place in that movie. There's there's twin brothers that share DNA. Yeah. There's robotic takeovers. There's Rob gets, Schneider inside a food robot. Rob Schneider. Uh, uh, <laughs> Too much Rob Schneider. Sent out into the desert at one point. They, they meet people who eat people. Like it's that place movie goes places. Well, yeah, if I remember it correctly, it's basically like, um, and this is something that um, it seems to me like a lot of movies were doing at the time, and it, it would upset fanboys. Where basically we're going to give you the character that you came here to see in the first five to 10 minutes or maybe 20 minutes in the movie in act one, you're going to get the character. Okay. 
and then something's going to happen that completely shatters the character's existence and this is going to give him the uh that he's got to you know work his way back to being that character by the end of the movie or something like that right i mean that's what happens and then they partner him up with rob schneider who's basically like the audience surrogate character who gets to witness the world and have it explained to him by uh judge dread right isn't that basically the yeah and gets to react to it in a very hypermanic way yeah um i mean it's a stallone it's a movie all, through and through and it's a big budget thing you know i mean i don't remember hating it when it came out it was just kind of like no, it's got it's it's got its merits i still find it entertaining i'd watch it again yeah but the character in that you'd say is very different than from the character in this and therefore i think this one they say is closer to the the spirit of the comic which i i gotta admit i haven't read so i'm not i'm not sure of this but what right i mean from you who, who've seen it what do you think is the biggest uh there's sean yawning right into the mic again oh, I'm what, sorry, do you I'm sorry, I <laughs> what do you think sorry. is the it's very late when we're doing this i mean it's like three o'clock in the morning i've been up all day i spent all my energy in my apartment i'm so sorry um what's the biggest difference that you saw in the characterization of judge dread between the two movies Stallone's well, way more emotional, I think. Yeah, I was going to say, Stallone shows way more emotion, and there's more character development, in my opinion. Yes. There's, there's more Stallone yelling in that movie, yeah. I would have to say. I mean, he screams that I am the law. Uh, yeah. Oh, I got my Stallone lip down. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's, that's, that's not podcast, good. Sean. That's good Stallone lip. <laughs> For, yeah, for you listeners, he was doing a fairly good Stallone lip, I gotta say. That's pretty good. <laughs> well, in this uh, post-apocalyptic future, um, I mean, society is completely, I mean, it looks kind of like everything's deteriorated into chaos and anarchy. Well, that's not true because, I mean, there are utilities and services and all that stuff, but it's a grimy future, kind of, right? I mean, like you see cars on the mega freeways and people are going about their business and it's a huge still city. It's so. very grimy. I didn't see many people in like suits or anything. Like they pretty much concentrate on the the lower levels of society that we see. Yeah, like right from the get-go, because we don't really see what the rest of the world is like. And I don't know if this is also a thing with the comics, um, but basically we're introduced to the Hall of Justice, which is where uh, the judges come from. Uh, The judges and Judge Dredd are basically law enforcement officers who are given the capability to be judge, jury, and executioner Mm -hmm. all in one uh, package. Um, Yes. But it's like <laughs> kind of like nowadays. Uh, the- <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, but this is backed up by the the future <laughs> law. Movie. So you wonder, yeah. <laughs> you wonder what happens in the future that basically, because I'm like, I guess one of the things I was curious about, we never really get motivation for the judges. Like I don't under, I don't get the ideals that they are upholding, other than just trying to fight back the uh, you know complete anarchy from tearing everything down or something i mean it's like what yeah what got so extreme that they are able to be judge jury and executioner like how did we get to that point i guess you know it's for another movie because we're just kind of dealing with a certain situation at this point but yeah and it's maybe explored in the comics i mean again i'm I'm sure that comic readers will tell us you know or we'll be able to shed a light on some of this stuff but we're just basically looking at 24 hours in the life of uh, judge dread in this movie, yeah, I was gonna say, it, it is it, it is an odd choice that it really does just jump into this whole world without giving us like any detail about it. Like, yeah, we get some exposition from our from Dread, our narrator, um, at the beginning and then at the end, but they really do just jump into this world, and we're just like, okay, we like well, there's lots of questions, like we're saying, and we get no backstory about it. You know, I. I I'm used to um, I'm used to packaging Judge Dredd and Demolition Man because they were the double feature like of the '90s. You watch the you watch the two, and sure. <laughs> and I, I guess I'm just I'm used to getting the, that story of how we got there and the and like you said the motives behind what made them judges. Yeah, you what? know we're not good. I think I just think it's such a strange choice, and I, I'm not sure I'm not sure it totally works. I feel like we don't feel very much because of that. Well, yeah, because I, I, I'm just, you know, I mean, like, there's no, well, like I said, I don't under, I don't know what uh, his adherence to the law is, other than it's the governing, you know, like this is that's the, I am the law. I, I've been, you know, 
charged with, you know, being he is the law. All the judges are the law. But it's right. like what uh what you know, what's that protecting society? You know, I mean, I don't know. This is a bigger question or something for this movie, but no, it's, it's like it just yeah, doesn't it's, it's true because you're watching this movie and you're just supposed to accept that he's a law, but I think the whole audience is like, Well, why? Yeah, because like, then it gr- I see it, none of these thoughts cross my mind watching that. I just kind of accept the reality we're presented with. But well, yeah, I, I kind of went that way as well. I don't question like what happened before this movie. And maybe that's just because it's a, a world I'm kind of already familiar with from the previous movie. I don't question that, but it's just, I'm right. fine with how this just jumps into like a day in the life. of t- right. you know. We have judges, we have high crime go. Yeah. yeah. But later on, it's going to, it's going to come up, I guess, because it's like, well, why does he so rigidly, you know, st- stick with this unless we're just supposed to go he is somehow you know believes in the moral uh idea I mean, of this you concept. could ask that same question about our current cops we have some that stick to their rigid uh upholding the law and some who don't just like this movie well the um so the, they basically like uh the movie sets up its primary antagonist is a drug dealer named mama what do you, can you tell us about mama she bit her pimp's dick off. She feminized dead. him with her teeth is the way I remember it being explained. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> feminized him with, yeah. Yeah. Uh, who's she played by? Lena Headey from Game of Thrones. Yeah. She, uh, I'm trying to think like where I first saw Lena Headey. Was it- she had more to do in this movie than in the whole last season of Game of Thrones. Yeah. Not so much, <laughs> in though. The, she was in that, um... Terminator TV series as Sarah Connor. Yeah, yeah. and she I was in 300. Time, I think the first time most people saw her was in 300. 300, yeah. yeah. probably. But she's had, like, a lot of, I mean, like, she's been in a lot of, uh, you know, genre, sci-fi, you know, horror stuff uh, on the lower budget. I mean, she works a lot, you know, even before she landed Game of Thrones. Um, here, yeah, she's a former hooker turned uh, mob boss. Uh, that, you know, ends up taking over one of these um, apartment blocks and she manufactures a drug called slow-mo. What do you think of slow-mo? It's pretty cool. I, like I dug it. it. It was cool. I, would, I wouldn't mind seeing this in 3D. Hey, I did this see it in 3D. This is the only movie worth watching in 3D. Ouch. Ever. Oh, disagree. <laughs> Although <laughs> That's the, a compliment to this movie, I think. Well, watch Colin yeah. bought some stock in 3D about 10 years ago. And that, no, it is a compliment. It is a compliment to this movie because even I have a few points where like, mm, I wonder what that's like in 3D. And I hate 3D with a passion. Yeah. And even I was over, curious. Going over those balconies in 3D. Right? Well, see, that's <laughs> where, this be pretty trippy stuff in there. Well, that's where like I'm sitting there as a 3D you know, connoisseur, right? The, the, uh, the, the depth, the amount of depth in most of the shots uh, what is really shallow, which is always my, my problem with the 3D movie. Uh, you know, from Avatar on forward, you kind of watch them and then you go like, well, why in the hell did I have to watch that in 3D? Because I don't remember any, you know, big uh, scenes where things were reaching out into the, the audience. This one does save it for, uh, it's primarily apparent during the slow-mo, because uh, the slow-mo is a drug that basically when you take it, it slows your brain down to like, what was it? One, one percent. One, to one percent of speed. And so we get I these, lo- and it adds like glitter to everything. <laughs> yeah, that's I the love- Every- trip stuff. Everything sparkles like a vampire. I love that the apparatus it's in is like a medicinal inhaler. Well, that's okay. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Fallout games, but there's a drug in Fallout called Jet, and it's the exact same thing. It slows time down 1%, and it's an inhaler just like that. Oh, really? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, we should check and see if like uh, if that is a concept of the comics or if they just ripped it off from Fallout. Who knows? <laughs> um, it makes fighting in that game a lot easier. It's like bullet it's like, time. Uh, it's like Deadeye and... Uh in, yeah, in uh, Red Dead. Red, yeah. yeah, in Red Dead. Bullet yeah. time and in, in what was it? Max Payne. Was that the first yeah. game that did the, the post matrix? Yeah. We're all slowed down. This does the, the, feel game, like a video the game that game taught you to doesn't... take drugs to to get through your levels and shit. Yeah, it does Narcotic. kind of feel like a, the Michaela. It does kind of feel like this would have been a good. Um, 
Well, it didn't. It didn't feel as much as a like a video game level thing to me as uh, what was it that we watched a couple of weeks ago? Where I was having that, you know, it's like, wow, this is you know, you set your people up and they got to get through this level and this level until they get to the boss. After, was it After Earth? After mm-hmm. Earth, yeah. Yep. Yeah. I mean, this felt less to me like that, but I think you could adapt this. It felt like you could probably adapt this into a video game and Ooh, be pretty successful cool. with it. Yeah. You could um, choose your bullets and everything. Oh, that was so cool. That's like one of my favorite things about this movie. <laughs> I even liked it in the original. It was like double whammy. It shoots the two dudes through the wall. It's a voice activated gun that just kind of like, yeah, it's got all this different ammo in it. Heat mm-hmm. hot shot is your uh, incendiary. I oh, know he has incendiaries yeah. also. Hot shots, incendiaries, high X explosives. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Armor piercing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is good stuff when you always have to have your. Does that gun have a name? Because I know I the, so. the bikes are the lawgiver, uh, right? Lawgiver, yeah. Or is that the gun? That's the, that's the gun. The gun. The gun is the lawgiver. Okay. You do, don't you think it should be called like the sentencer or something? Yeah, like something like executioner. Yeah. yeah. I like, I like uh, lawgiver, though. Lawgiver's cool. The lawgiver. Yeah. I'm going I'm to give you some law. <laughs> oh, that sounds like a porn. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> what did you think really of... Uh, some law. Well, since you've <laughs> you've seen the other one where in Rob Sh- Rob Schneider's delivery, you always kind of uh, remember because he mocks Stallone with that line. Yeah, uh, Mr. I am the law. law. Yeah, what'd you think of it? Because then you got to go like, well, Carl Urban is clearly trying to not do what Stallone did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I am the law. He's more like easy Batman dread. I was gonna say he's more like Christian Bale dread. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, she's not the law. I'm the law. <laughs> I think it's it pretty much it. Off. <laughs> yeah, it's keep it simple. Yeah. Uh, Dread is partnered up with your audience surrogate character. Uh, this is a new judge, a rookie judge uh, named Anderson. She's played by uh, who was it? Olivia Thurlby. Olivia Thurlby. You all remember from movies such as Juno. You know. Mm-hmm. And. Yeah. For those sci-fi nerds of you out there, The Darkest Hour. Not the one with Gary Oldman. We're talking about the one with the invisible aliens that attack Moscow and get trapped in Faraday cages. Anyone? 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 No. I didn't see it. I've always wanted to, though. <laughs> Wait, was that the one? Was Emil Hirsch in that Yes, he was. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, okay. I remember seeing the trailer a lot for that. Yeah. Another 3D epic from this uh, this time. Yeah, that one didn't do too good either, I think. No. Um, good enough. But yeah, I get, well, sorry, final word on the 3D. Yeah, there was like some, whenever they would, because uh, during the, the slow-mo sequences, there's a lot of particles in the air that seem to be, you know, in my, uh, in the room, uh, glass shattering that seemed to come out, that kind of stuff. So it did, you know, make it a cool experience during those, uh, those moments. Uh, it's not really pronounced during the rest of the movie. And even though they said that they shot it with 3D cameras, I'm sitting there going like, that looks like a 2D conversion to 3D. That looks like a 2D conversion. And then there were shots that, didn't even have 3D, but I'm sure there were parts that were shot with 3D cameras. Oh yeah, yeah, you Maybe. can tell. Yeah, certain yeah. scenes. Mm-hmm. Um, so Thurlby is a judge candidate, but she has a special talent. What's that? She's psychic. Why? Because she grew up next to a radiation plant, <laughs> a nuclear plant, rather. Well, there's. Did the she end. say that at some point? They say that when they're like introducing her, they said she grew up within like 100 kilometers and her parents both died of radiation cancer. Okay. And they're like reading yeah. off her bio. They say that. Okay. Yeah. Cause I think that's a thing with the, well, any kind of radio, radioactive future post-apocalyptic thing. You always have your mutants, right? Mm-hmm. Which I believe the original judge dread movie, I keep saying the original, but the first attempt at this, let's say that, <laughs> uh, it does have like mutant, dread. mutant dudes, right? There's like big, Aren't there like out in the wasteland oh. with the cannibals? But yeah, those are like mutant mutants. You're saying like, like hills have deformed, eyes, mutants. Yeah, like deformed mutants. Yeah, yeah, with like uh, bionic implants and all. That. I yeah, remember I those guys. Don't believe they have any special powers. They are just deformed. <laughs> yeah. So she's a empath psychic who can uh, read people's minds. So this is uh, th- so today is basically this is training day, the movie for Judge Dredd. Uh, mm-hmm. right. Or she's going to be Pretty graded much. by dread on her performance. So they go to this place called peach trees. This is one of the giant, um, tower block where mama has killed a couple of, uh, folks and splattered them on the ground. 
uh, threw him out of like an 80 story building or whatever and <laughs> right into the courtyard. Well, they skinned him alive and then threw them out. So they didn't die until they hit the ground. And worse, yeah, they and, gave him slow mo. And they gave, <laughs> yeah. The worst part is they gave him slow mo first. So everything seemed to be in slow motion, which is just so cruel. Yeah. That's because this is. Your, your heart probably explodes before you hit the ground. Just from the terror alone. Yeah. Yeah, these are, yeah probably. These are tough, no compromise gangs. Um, so, so Dredd and, and um, Coleman get in there, and then they come across. What do you call her? What do you call her? A- Anderson. Oh, that's what I say, Coleman. Whoops. Yeah. Sorry, what Anderson. What did you say, Coleman? Coleman. I was thinking Olivia <laughs> Coleman for some reason, but it's Olivia yeah, Philby. Just, right? just call her the rookie. That's what he calls her. Oh, okay. All right. Dredd and the rookie. Yeah. Um, he brings, uh, well, they, um, they catch a guy. Um, who turns out to be one of Mama's uh, like chief or, officers, or, right? I mean, uh, like just like a like a higher henchman. Yeah, but he somehow knows something about because her whole thing is that she's actually producing this slow, the slow slow mo the new drug. Like she's making and distrib- distributing it through the entire mega city. It comes out of this place, right? How does he, like, uh, he's some kind of lieutenant in the organization, obviously, but yeah. I wasn't entirely sure if he was, you know, like, minister of finance or you know, some kind of... He was a, the tre- yes, he's treasurer. He's treasurer. They caught, the, he was they caught the treasurer. Involved in the... Somehow he's, he's in the, in the Yeah, he's just a higher up who, you know, happens to know. He's got to know to do his job, so... They got a scene here where they catch this guy. Uh, the judges bust in in an apartment where a couple of the guys have just taken the slow-mo. Mm-hmm. So we kind of see it from their point of view as these judges come in and like blast the living fuck out of everything in slow motion. <laughs> yeah. This is the scene I think of when I think of this movie. <laughs> it's, it's very, uh, it's, uh, I don't know, it's, my, it's not weird to say, but it's very beautiful. Um, yeah. It's very uh, operatic. Um, it's like a ballet. It's like a violent ballet. Uh, mm-hmm. It's done very well. Well, I like that whenever the bullet you know, because we get slow motion bullets going through faces and ripping out the, you know, the other side of the cheek and right at the camera and the gore and viscera all flying at us. But they do this thing where they must have been on the set using air cannons or something to yeah. blast these guys because you see their skin going <laughs> you know, in slow motion. <laughs> yeah, the guy who gets blown back from the door and the guy who gets shot in the face, you could tell there was like an air cannon blowing into his mouth. Mm-hmm. to get that sort of look mm-hmm. and everything's kind of like hazy and glittery and sparkly at the same time very like psychedelic it's pretty mm-hmm. awesome yeah it is pretty cool this is uh he said who the director what's his name peter pete travis did we say what he what else he's done he did like two action movies that i had like vaguely heard of one was called like Endgame, and the other one was vantage point or something like that Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah! I remember that. <laughs> that's like vantage it. point. He has like six credits total, or something like that. Oh so. no! Yeah, that and was this is like, his biggest credit. So that's a horrible movie. It was a yeah, political assassination good. thriller told from multiple vantage points. You get it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not good. <laughs> not good. Um, so that one in theater, I was very disappointed. <laughs> but these scenes are pretty well executed and well directed. And, you know, I mean, this is like a thing that's like, yeah, like Mikhail said, you're going to remember the movie for the slow mo sequences, which are very cool. Um, the whole movie, actually, the exteriors, I was wondering about this interior. Like uh, the exteriors, you know, we see a lot of the cities and it's supposed to be, you know, I, I can't actually remember uh, if they identified where exactly in the world it is, but it was shot in. Yeah. Uh, Johannesburg, I think, South Africa, Cape, or Town. Cape Town. Um, do you know where the hell they shot uh, the main level of peach trees? Don't know. I just this, everything I read said they shot mostly in South Africa, but didn't specify like which locations were shot where. Well, the only thing that I've ever seen, maybe that looks like maybe something like Logan's Run or something. It's like a giant. I mean, it looks like it could be a. Uh, I don't know, like a shopping mall court, right? With right. stairs on all four sides going up to another, you know, a higher level. But if that's a set, that was impressive in scale because it's gigantic. I mean, it's mm-hmm. huge. 
Mm-hmm. And then I go, is there actually a place like this or what did they convert to, you know, make it look like, you know, is it actually outdoors? Is this a, you know, an exterior courtyard that they just put like a tarp over to put sh- shadows on it or something, but it's impressive in scale and it kind of gives you the idea of mm-hmm. how big these places are. They're like, a, it's like a, a city in itself, right? And just in I multiple would levels. Yeah. The size of a block. With a big open, uh, open center court. Um, well, Mama wants this guy back. This uh, actor I recognized from Blade Runner 2049. Which is Wood Harris, I think is his name. I think he was in some I other so. like, sci-fi yeah, thing. Yeah, he's been in a, a few things. We've all seen him. He's yeah. been around. Well, he... Uh, so she wants him back because he's going to spill the beans on this organization. So what does she do? What's her big plan here? Because that can't Kill help. Kill them all. But how? Big guns. <laughs> Oh, she locks the whole place down well, yeah. and puts a bounty, basically. It's one of those deals where she gets Dom Hall. Dom, what? Donald? Donald. Gle- Donald Gleason. Who, his character is like, got these robot eyes. You remember why that happened? Or what his whole deal she, is? She, she punctured she his eyes, him. remember? She tortured yeah. him. Yeah, we see this in and flashbacks. She- and I think a little bit at the beginning, you see her like... Yanking. So he's like not, he's part, part of her organization, but by only by f- coercion. Force. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. The, um, so basically, yeah, she gets him. He's a, you know, whatever, a, uh, uh, security genius or, you know, hacker genius. And so he taps in the whole building and gets them to shut the whole thing down, which means these giant shutters close over everything. And you're immediately plunged into interior darkness and then she gets over the loudspeaker and says, basically, we've got two judges in the building and I want them dead. And so until I get what I want, I'm not opening this place back up. Oh, and if you shelter them, I'm going to kill like the next three generations of your family or something like that. Mm-hmm. Right? <laughs> Very harsh. Seems, re- seems reasonable. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> this movie at this point in the plot reminds me of another movie that came out Right around the same time, have any of you guys seen the martial arts classic, The Raid Redemption? Yeah, it came out the same year. <laughs> but doesn't it have like a remarkably similar, I mean, like that is the idea. Yeah. You get cops stuck in a building with a drug dealer on the top floor and they got to fight their way up and uh, there's yeah. a bounty on their head. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's the exact same part. How, how does that come out the same year? <laughs> This is what People in Hollywood don't talk to each other, I guess. It's, it's kismet. It's the Deep Impact Armageddon situation. Yeah, yeah but I feel, I feel like, I don't know, too, Deep Impact Armageddon, like, well, like he, this one's really specific. <laughs> well, you want to do your underwater horror movie, you get your uh, Leviathan, Abyss, and Deep Star Six all in the same year. Didn't we have, like, uh, I thought Word gets a, around. Yeah. I mean, they always seem to be, I don't know, because uh, um, The Raid Redemption is uh, is an Indonesian movie, I believe. It's got a British director, but it was like made, you know, hell and gone. You know what, actually, I thought about this movie, even though it's filmed in South Africa and it has a lot of people doing American accents or American actors, it still feels like a British movie. Did you get that off of this? It does not feel like America. It yeah. felt like it was happening right next to District 9. Yeah. Really? yeah, yeah. I mean, which is yeah. also shot in like Joe Burke, South Africa. Yeah. Actually, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was really good feel. Me, like, uh, it was over there. It was giving me vibes of the movie um, Wanted. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, the bullet the vendors. I have not yeah, seen that movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, so. that yeah, it, it really to, uh, made me think of that a lot. <laughs> actually, it's a bad yeah. movie. Really, it's what was the? Uh, that's a Timur Bekmenbekov movie. The Russian oh, director who directed The Darkest Hour. Bam, bringing it back all around. Oh, um, no. And Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. Let's not forget that. But he did a did couple he of. Did that Nine movie too? Yeah, the Wait, animated. The, the musical or the animated one? The animated one. Okay. Yeah. But before that, he did a couple of Russian movies called Night Watch and Day Watch, which oh, were okay. kind of cool. Oh, okay. I remember that guy. Um, yeah. why we're t- okay. you're, you're furthering my case that he sucks, Colin. <laughs> why did it remind you of Wanted? I'm curious, like, what the. Uh, I, I mean, it, maybe it was just the slow motion because there's a lot of slow motion in that movie too. I don't know, but there was a several times. I only saw it the one time, obviously, because that movie sucks. But it might have just been the the like the general like style, like the coloring and the slow motion. I don't know because I th- I feel like that was a bright movie too, and this was a very bright movie. The movie with the loom of time. 
Was it the loom of yeah. time? Yeah. Oh, okay. God. Um, the loom of time. The loom of yeah. time. Oh, you got to see it. Yes. It's <laughs> an actual loom, Sean. Like like that you weave on. Yeah. Like a yeah. controls time. A loom. Yeah, you're hearing it right. <laughs> the loom of time. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's put it this way. Don't say any more because I don't want to watch the movie. And if you do, I'm probably going to watch the movie. And I don't want to. It's Sean's so curse. Please, let's Sean's going to bring it. it. We've, we've it, already yeah. opened the door. Sean's going to bring it. They shoot bullets you know, around corners in that movie, Sean. I know, I know. Exactly. They've been bullets. And yeah. McAvoy it's leans out of a car to shoot yeah. things. And yeah, I don't want to watch this movie. Jim's McAvoy. <laughs> no, I don't want to watch that whole movie. <laughs> the main... The main song is uh, an original no, from Danny Elfman. No, no, no. Get off of it. No, stop <laughs> saying things. <laughs> um, oh. Okay. So I'm gonna bring it out and blame us. Yeah, you I made mean, me do I mean, it. He says. Aren't all my picks kind of your guys' fault? Really? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, they're not. Personal accountability, Sean. It's all your fault. <laughs> um. So the. Uh, so this, that's the gist. That's the setup of the movie. And then basically our judges are going to have to survive in this situation as uh, all of Mama's henchmen come after them. Uh, any sequences here that stand out to you? Um, I mean, because it's basically just a full throttle action movie at this point, right? Yeah. I mean, at the very beginning when he shoots the incendiary into the guy's mouth, that was pretty cool. That was good. Melted his face. Yeah, yeah. That's um, when cool. she brings out like the machine gun turrets and shoots across the uh, block, that was pretty cool. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think that actually happens in the raid also. Oh, no. like that. But yeah, the uh, idea that the, across the open court, right? They just kind of yeah. they lock it off on the other side, and the judges are back there somewhere. We're going to fire these massive fifty cal with you know Gatling guns with armor piercing rounds uh, yeah. through the thing. That was pretty cool. Um, how did nobody get hit? Right. Well, I mean, plenty of people got hit, but the judges did not get hit. Yeah, I mean, that was also the thing I think about, like, uh, Judge Dredd. Um, he's very, um, I mean, just, you know, going after, like, what his character is, he's very um, calm, collected, always seems to know exactly what his capabilities are and, mm. you know, what response he's going to have to any given situation, even though he is able to roll with, um, you know, whatever decisions come up. Cause he leaves actually the whole, cause to him, and this was the kind of thing, I guess that makes his character kind of a badass and cool. It's like, he is in there to like, you know, it's like, well, here's the thing. We got to go take this person out. And that's basically all we're doing. So how we do that? And like, well, you're, I'm trained. You're, you know, I'm, you're on uh, your training rookie. What do you think we should do? And she's like, well, we should go do this. And he's like, okay, we're going to go, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so just kind of proceeds that way. The whole thing to him, even though it's like, this might be the worst day of his life. It's, <laughs> you know, to him, it's just like any other day. You'd never know it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's why you have to, uh, you have to make his side character way more uh, interesting because I don't think you're going to get any, I guess, satisfaction out of dread emotionally. Um, I yeah. mean, you get it with the, with the action and the kind of like the cool lines and stuff, but as far as like a character arc, you ain't going to get it from him. Well, I mean, you sort of get something at the end. A little bit. Yes. He has, you, you do feel at the end, he has learned something from his rookie, mm-hmm. which is why he passes her. Which is actually, but, I mean, that's a v- complete violation of his code, which I think is why it's, Im- it's important. Right. As far as a character arc, like, mm-hmm. The whole thing is it's so completely rigid that basically I think one of the rules is like if you lose your firearm that you fail automatic mm-hmm. fail. You know, he gives a whole bunch of things at the beginning of the movie. It's like you do this, you do this, you do this automatic fail. You can never become a judge. Well, of course, she loses her firearm. She gets captured at one point by the evil gang who's going to, you know, do horrible things to her. And at the end of the movie, yeah, he, you know, when given the, you know, it's like, well, does she pass or fail? He gives her a pass. I mean, you thought that she he did that because uh, maybe that was the thing. Of like, even though he was so um, you know unflappable in the case of it, he recognized like a, a strength in this officer. It's like you know she would be I, a benefit to the the force. <laughs> I I think so. And the and the scene that does it is when which was came as a shock to me because when you see these movies or when you see Judge Dredd, he's always handing out justice, but. 
the only justice you ever see him giving out is like it's it's um, it's them being sentenced to something bad or being killed. She um, passes judgment in sort of a positive way, where she lets uh, Donald Gleason's character go, and you kind of don't think of that uh, as uh, when the judges are, are passing judgment. That the judgment would be to like, all right, you're. I don't find you guilty. You're free to go. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of. Uh, uh, it was a shocking moment to me, but I think he or she convinces him at that point that that is a worthy route to go and that the judges need that. He so learns why. that there's exceptions to the rules, right? Yes. Yeah. And that she might be the exception to the, the judges rules of the pass fail test. Right. So I take it back that he doesn't have an arc because he does, mm-hmm. uh, he does change. Um, but yes. Yeah, but could you even read it on his face? I mean, I guess you can. I mean, that's the thing. He does, I mean, he, gives a, he does a different <laughs> lower lip. I noticed the different lower lip. Did you see that moment? Yeah, yeah. Where he, where he's like, okay. Uh-huh. He gives a different scowl. It's pretty great. This guy I is mean, a brilliant I, actor. I would, argue, <laughs> I would argue there's actors out there that don't have their face covered that also don't show any emotion. It's very there's true. some shitty actors out there that don't convey emotion when their face isn't covered. Yeah. Yeah, Carl but it's like, Urban did that, more with his face covered than most regular actors do. Yeah, I love a lot of the framing in this movie too because he is basically his mouth. Most yeah, of yeah. the fr- most of the frame is all centered up just on his mouth. <laughs> you know, he does these angles. I mean, well, there. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's an interesting him and because later there are these four other judges, three four other judges that come into the place mm. that actually come in on the payroll of Mama. Which I kind of wonder that, you know, because then I'm like, I'm sure there are corrupt judges in the original uh, uh, comic, but it's like, you know, I mean, the whole idea, if you're going to make this like class of, uh, you know, judge, jury and executioner, you have to take away any kind of, uh, you know, earthly thing that they would want and provide it for them. Right. Or whatever. So they don't want a, a million dollars that we can split four ways. It seems right. kind of like, what the fuck are they going to do with that money? <laughs> you know, but OK, for the purpose of the movie, it's like these guys are in it for the cash and they're going to try and kill dread. And this came this was the so then this is the like later whatever quarter of the movie. It's them fighting the other judges. Yeah. And that was when it became like, OK, now you're getting into that kind of tricky thing situation where everybody looks exactly in the same costumes and who are we looking at at any given point in time <laughs> right i i mean i i think it works for the movie i think it adds a sort of attention to it because who are we looking at what, what judge just got shot did they get dread or is that you know i think it works in the misdirection of what is happening if it's not too confusing so you guys i do like the design of the badges and i like how big they are Yes. Yeah. They read pretty well on screen most of the time. Yeah. I mean, there were, they do it. They, they, you know, knowing that that's a problem, obviously for your audience, they do, I think, pull it off fairly well. Uh, there was only a couple times where I was like, you know, they introduced the bad judges and then you see one of them, you know, in a hallway doing something. I'm like, wait, was that him? Or was that Judge Dredd? And then later I'm like, I think that was Judge Dredd who yeah, did that. I and had then, that same one. Yeah. Um, but otherwise I think they were very cognizant of that and tried to like, you know, maintain clarity as best that they could. Um, mm-hmm. also, also that plot point doesn't last very long. So I think that's helpful too. For sure. Yeah. Um, they, they try to keep the, the captive dude alive for as long as they can, but, um, you know, because obviously they want to get him back to, uh, the hall of justice so they can find out the whole, uh, inner workings. They introduce a plot point there, which I thought was convenient and not utilized later when it could have been, uh, which was that uh, Anderson has this ability not only to be psychic, but she can actually go into your mind and warp your vision of reality, right? Mm -hmm. It was a pretty cool scene where she tortures the, you know, to get the information out of him. uh, She constructs this like, you know, um, simulated, you know, environment where he thinks that he's in control, but it turns out she's actually in control of, of uh, his subconscious. How come they never brought that back when she was like in a position to, you know, when they're pointing guns at her and they're going to do stuff to her? And like, why do we forget about the, her ability to do that? Is there 
I mean, it depends. Is there more than one person around? I don't know. We don't know how strong she is, or how strong her powers are. Well, I thought maybe they'd do it in that scene where it was him alone with her again in the end when the, the situation's flipped and he's got, you know, the drop on her. Right. I, I, she may be just be waiting for the whole gun situation to go off. Yeah. Like she may, she knows that fact, so she may, and she sees he's holding it, so she may be just be waiting for that to happen. Yeah, the guns are uh, ID printed, of course, which you figure yeah. everybody would know at that at that point. But you, you would think so, right? They would know judges' guns are print or ID printed to each judge. You would think they'd know that? Yeah. I mean, they did say at the beginning of this movie that they rarely ever get judges in that block because it's so overrun with crime that like True. the judges feel outnumbered. So. I mean, that blocks 200 floors and what they say, like it was a re- it was a really high number of people that lived there. I remember that mm-hmm. yeah, it was like a small true. city, basically. So, I mean, I guess if like judges haven't been in there in a while, maybe generations even, maybe they don't know. Yeah, true. because I think at the beginning, he says something like they can only respond to like six percent of the uh, of the calls that come in because crime is so rampant in the city. Right. And there's not enough of the judges or whatever. So, yeah, there's, like, these complete, you know, lawless uh, sections where apparently, like, they can just, like, lock down a door and the judges can't come in anyway because <laughs> mm-hmm. that's part of the whole uh, security thing that uh, Gleason sets up. But, yeah, she lets him go because she's able to psychically read, you know, that he was basically been forced into this, mm-hmm. right? That's why she, you know, determines not to, or her judgment of him is that, you know, that he can he can leave. Yes. Um, that was a funny bit with the vagrant. I thought uh, that was the only time. Like, <laughs> as he's walking by, he sees this guy uh, sitting by the door. Like, you know, vagrancy. What's the judgment? You know, time in an isolation cube. Don't be here when I come back. <laughs> <laughs> it pays off too because he's still. There. It does. I told you not to be. <laughs> <laughs> then the blast door comes down and smushes the poor guy. Um, oh. The. Um, so basically, yeah, you got to fight through these wave of judges. Uh, Judge Dredd gets injured at some point. He does. I also didn't think this was going to happen. Okay. Because um, he does, uh, and he's fighting with the last, uh, I think it's Lex, the last judge who's come in to kill him. Um, and he gets an armor-piercing round right through his midsection. Uh, I was kind of surprised. So they Especially actually get, they uh, would injured. get injured? Yeah, like it seemed like it's like, oh, this is well, this is not good. But uh, yeah, so they got me. But it only lasts for about because he he has the um, whatever super glue with the yeah. auto well, stitches then in the, there. The other judge gets caught monologuing. Yeah, so he gets he gets nailed and dies. Wait, wait for what? <laughs> yeah, thing? yeah. That, I was just like, oh come on, just shoot him. You got him, just shoot him. Sometimes I root for the bad guys. I'm like, you guys are idiots. Just shoot the guy. <laughs> Jesus. Wait, for what? For her to shoot you. Yeah. 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 That's like, wow, you're really just setting it up for a heavy handed one liner right here. There was. Okay. That's a, fine. Was there a moment? Uh, he sounded like uh, Robocop at one point. It was, it was that you have 20 seconds to comply. To comply. Yeah. 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 10 yeah, they're seconds. They're pulling a little bit from stuff. Yeah. Yeah. He does. Uh, dispatch mama by the end of the movie i mean it feels like we haven't really talked about her character at all what what can you tell us about mama i mean she is the other driving force in this yeah she's like very calm and collected and i and like she'll just speak over the intercom system to the whole block and she definitely has like a hundred percent control of everyone around her i love that part in the beginning when she's like warning the judges she was like you can't get out I've shut everything down. You can either come to me or you can try to get out. But she says something to the effect of that. She's like, but to me, it doesn't really matter. And I love like her carefree. Like, I don't give a fuck what you guys do. Cause I'm, I have you trapped. Yeah. Well, she's very, she's confident in that she's got the upper hand. Uh, you can see, I see, I think this is why, uh, Gleason is important to her because he shows the fear that the judges are coming and, you know, kind of gives us the idea that, oh shit, like these guys are unstoppable. They've killed 30 people already and nobody's been able to touch them and they're coming up here to get us, you yeah. know, cause she's basically playing the poker face the whole time. You know, Lena Headey, Headley, Headey. I think it's Headey. Headey. It's a very attractive woman, but they have given her these teeth because I think this is a part of uh, <laughs> uh, the slow mo 
thing, right? Yes. It uh, it rot like meth. It rots your or teeth. Or drugs in like. general. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So they all have these nasty teeth, and she's got this horrible scar. Um. So she looks kind of very fearsome, you know. And she basically just kills uh kills you if you step out of line. Uh, like Darth Vader. Well, they, they, I mean, I just like how unfeeling she is. They say when they're like introducing her that she's known for her cruelty. Mm-hmm. Like she's known for torturing people. That's She's just a badass. Yeah. And Me too. I love this villain. Yeah. Well, she has this, uh, she's not going to go alone either. She's got a, a plan here at the end when she's finally cornered by the, uh, the judges. Um, she's got this uh, device that is used sometimes in sci-fi movies where uh, the villain like attaches a bomb transmitter basically to their heartbeat. Mm. Right. So the idea being you can't kill me because if you kill me, like the whole, this whole floor is wired with bombs. It's going to explode and kill everybody. The 50 floors above us or whatever. I actually thought they were on the top floor for some reason, but they weren't, were they? Yeah, I thought they were too. Weren't they? Well, she had an apartment she, or whatever she, on the top. She was. She says it'll blow up the top 50 and the rest will go. That still doesn't yeah. still mean she was on the top. Okay. Um, so the uh, Dread comes up with a solution to this, though. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a theory that he puts to test. This is not a solution. <laughs> He's like, well, we'll see how this goes. He got lucky. He got lucky. He, <laughs> he's like, whatever. He's like, I don't think, uh, well, uh, I don't think this will, uh, well, that signal seems pretty weak. I don't know. Will it go through, you know, uh, 200 floors of concrete and everything? Let's find out. And he shoves <laughs> her through a fucking window. Gives her a blast of uh, slow-mo, as it were, and then shoves her out of the window. He was right. She just dies. <laughs> yeah. The uh, the slow mo in the most beautiful way possible. Yeah, because yeah. they didn't really show say this. that death was that death was surprising. I didn't that that was cool. Mm-hmm. Well, it mirrors the execution that she did of the three guys at the beginning, but we didn't really get to see that from their perspective. Yeah. Um, for this one, we do see how long you know it takes her to actually fall in three D with a bunch of uh, you know shattered glass around her. Um, but when she hits the ground, the camera does a deal where it's like it is the 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 ground plane, and she kind of very slowly smushes into it and splatters all over the place. Like, yeah. Ugh. I mean, it's what you, if you're in with this movie up to this point, that's what you want. I kind of wanted the other angle, excuse me, um, where we see her whole body slowly coming towards the ground. Like, I'm like, I want to see how it bends and folds up and like, this sounds fucked up, but I want to see how it breaks and, <laughs> and does that from coming off of 200 floors. I want to see what this looks like. Yeah. Cause she lands face first. Yeah. yeah. The skin mm-hmm. guys, they just went down. on the ground, but she goes face first, like right into it. It's disgusting and glorious. It's beautiful. Yeah. This movie is pretty gory. Um, yeah, it is. It bloody, is. Violent. It's a big body count too. I think that's mm-hmm. the, I think that's what you're going for. I think that's uh, I mean they're definitely they give you the hyper violence for uh, on purpose because they're like well that's that's what this movie is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, a lot of it is CG, uh, you know, CG blood splatter and all that other stuff. But the intent is there anyway, and they do show things ripping open and exploding out of bodies and stuff like that. So. Yeah, I mean, we you get can- to see that one guy's head completely spilled open on at the beginning. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah, because that was a couple things that uh, in 3D, uh, it actually did like when uh, Judge Dredd at one point um, knocks the throat of one of the other, the evil judges in, and in 3D, you can see the dent, you know, going into <laughs> into his throat, like, uh, and that one guy at the beginning, I think when they pull back the sheet on the body, you can see the, you know, the, the depression of his face. They also did something weird like that in the... Um, the scene where Anderson was in um, the dude's mind, they warped their faces. So like there was weird depth pa- pockets throughout their face, you know, like one eye would be normal and the other one was like sunken way back and mm. all that kind of stuff. It was really uh, strange. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, That's somebody sitting in the editing room, just go like, fuck with the 3d a bit. See what happens. <laughs> got it that. did kind of feel like that. Yeah. It's like, well, we'll do this because we can. Why not? Because we can. Why not? Yeah. Um, the movie uh, was not a success when it came out. Michaela, what, uh, you know, budget to 
to uh, box office ratio? Yes, its budget was estimated somewhere between 35 and 45 million, and it made 41. Ooh. I mean, I can see that because there's people out there like like me. I mean, this movie's eight years old, and it's the first time I've seen it. I mean, uh, there was I, no marketing for this movie whatsoever. Yeah, I don't remember much. No one knew it came out. out. But, yeah, I saw yeah. trailers for it uh, a lot, I think, uh, that it was kind of dread 3D, you know, because um, I think it was a Lionsgate release here, and so it was on, like, a lot of stuff. But I wonder if the Stallone movie, um, you know... Soured people on it? I wonder, you know? Probably... I don't know if people look back fondly at like, I got to see more of that character, you know, especially if we don't have Stallone. It's got some guy, you know, if you don't know Carl Urban, then it's just this guy in a helmet. You know, I get the idea that like the comic people who like it are like, this is what we you know signed up for in the first place. But it might be a hard sell to people who are unfamiliar with the the character. I mean, apparently it was think about it. This is right in that time where we're remaking all those 80s and 90s sci-fi movies. This is right around the same time as we got the Total Recall and RoboCop remakes mm-hmm. that were both not good. So I can see why people are just like, really, you keep hitting us with these remakes that we don't really want. Yeah, and it's kind of like, um, and I'm not saying quality-wise now, but it could appear this way to the average moviegoer, like the new Hellboy movie versus the old one. You know, it's like... Right. It's not the same guy and it's called Hellboy and like, you know, that one didn't do well either. I don't yeah. think. Right. Um, yeah. But it did. Uh, this movie does, like we said, have a cult following. Now there's um, Carl Urban has been carrying the torch for years um, for doing a second movie. Didn't they talk about at some point, maybe a TV series with yeah, Carl that Urban was talked about? Yeah. Well, he's like, yeah. I don't know if he's tied up. He's doing the boys for... Uh, he's doing the boys, which yeah. is basically like kind of this, you know, hyper-violent action superheroes type thing. So he's kind of, he's doing a version of it, which is the but, boys, but... Man, if HBO decided to take up a Dread TV series, that would be awesome. Yeah. And now it's going to be like uh, Hulu or something or Apple. And you'll have to go get your fucking Apple subscription, too, so you can... Uh, there's some Tom Hanks movie coming out that Apple bought. And like That looks... Can't. generic as hell yeah well it was but that's the thing i want it to be hbo because i want it to be a network that's not afraid to put money into violence yeah yeah well neither is amazon apparently with have you seen the boys <laughs> no. pretty, yeah. i don't watch any <laughs> amazon shit. original programming there's some good stuff on there the boys are here is pretty good i've seen a couple of things yeah but you know if you like this you probably like that so who knows there may be more dread in your future i'm sure the character will get resurrected at some point there'll be another one yeah um okay is that uh yeah dread hey that's it i think it's that's dread all right well I'll tell you what don't stop listening yet because we haven't actually reviewed it and told you what we individually thought about it you think you know how this is going to go but it turns out that uh you know thing weird things have happened in the past so, first of all, I want you to stay tuned for that. But first of all, we're going to read some of your mail. And in order to do that, we're going to need the assistance of our mailman. His name's Igor. Bring us the mail. Masters! Masters, the mail! I've got the mail. So many letters. Our followers are rising. Rising. Why, thank you, Igor. Igor's got his little dread helmet on. I was going to say, he's got his little helmet on. (laughs) He just keeps saying, I am the law. I am the law. Yeah, he's legally required to wear that helmet. (laughs) Yeah, just for the next couple weeks. Only he's got (laughs) the... He's got a soft uh, spot on his head that we have to protect. He's got to harden up again. (laughs) And he's got the slow-mo teeth, you know, and all that stuff. He doesn't do the frown quite as good. and He's not pulling it off. No, it's because his lip keeps falling down. Like He's got to get that sewn back up. Igor, get that taken care of. Yeah. Uh, well, we want to let you know how you can get a hold of us. Follow along with the Saturday Night Freak Show right into us on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Saturday Night Freak Show. Or maybe Twitter's your thing. At Sat Freak Show. Maybe you're an emailer. Saturday Night Freak Show at Yahoo.com. Or if you are on Instagram, we're at Saturday Night Freak Show about dread. B-Movie Poster Vault writes in, 
and says dread should have been called dread the cinematic redemption as a collector of 2080 magazine as a kid it was the best feeling to watch a judge dread movie that didn't do everything wrong uh it includes <laughs> helmetless stallone anti-comedy rob schneider eight different stories in one plot etc he said finally we had a movie stripped to the basics dread is a by the books badass the action scenes were brutal and it just felt like a perfect love letter to the comic. Needed a sequel or five, of course. <laughs> nice. Uh, Tra Travis Legler writes in and says, I saw this one before the original. Comparing this to the original is like comparing Batman 89 to Batman and Robin. One is a lot of fun. The other is so-so, but that depends on your taste. This movie has good action and is very enjoyable. Look forward to hearing your thoughts. Nice. Yeah. All right. Michael Whitaker writes in and says this movie should be way better than it actually is. All the right elements are there, but I don't know about the rest of you, but it feels like there's almost no energy in the whole thing. It's a strangely sleepy or it's strangely sleepy for what should have been a kind of a higher energy action movie. I wonder if it feels that way just because it's confined to one location over the course of one day. It could be. It could, could be. be. Yeah. I think I yeah, I think I know what he's saying though. Are there I, I think, yeah, we'll get into it. Yeah. Well, Nelson Nascimento says negotiations over sentences, death sequel, please. I love this movie after the first film did not really expect much going into it the first time around and expectations are more than surpassed for me. I would put it above the original interpretation for sure. All right, Simon Carter. We'll get to it. <laughs> we'll get to it. Simon Carter, maybe you should just stop me if you want to say something to the. Yeah, I'll just keep going through them. You just uh, keep going and we'll okay. interrupt. All right. Uh, Simon Carter says, I really enjoyed the movie. I thought they did a good job capturing the dark humor spirit of the original comics. And before the obvious questions come up, I believe it was written before the raid. Carl Urban did a solid job as Dread, and Lena Headey was terrifying. Uh, Novato Judoka says it's the best $5 I've ever spent at Best Buy for the 3D Blu-ray. $5 bargain bin for the win. Nice. nice. <laughs> Nick Siebel writes in and says, Dread is in my top 10 best action movies of all time. This film is so underrated and should have gotten much more praise and bigger box office numbers. I saw the movie opening night in 3D. I was floored at how amazing the special effects were in the film. I don't care what anyone says. The Raid Redemption and Dread can coexist as great action films. They basically have the same story and came out the same year. Sit back and enjoy this damn good popcorn film. P.S. I am the law. Or I'm the law. Uh, Dave Forbes says, make sure you watch it in 3D. Robin Linneman Silverberg says it's one of the few films that I enjoyed in 3D. Scott Hainchek says this movie fucking slaps. It's one of my favorites. Uh, Anthony Leva says very good choice. This movie needs a sequel. Pat Nowacki says it's actually really, really good. And Peter Gatt says I caught this on cable recently and it wasn't very good. In my opinion. I mean, if it was edited for cable, it probably wasn't. Ooh, yeah. Yeah, that that's, that's legit. Cut all the good bits know, out of it. Don't, they don't edit for cable anymore, guys. Like, TBS yeah. is dropping mm, Netflix Depends on the shit. channel. There, that, there's still a lot of editing that happens on certain well, sure. channels. Well, about... Um, Two weeks ago, we watched a movie called 13 Ghosts. Uh, Michael Whitaker writes in again. He says, it almost seems like you could extract two different movies from this idea. One in which it's set in an old Victorian manner where we focus more on the ghosts and another where the family has to escape a death trap house. Says, I'll respect Michaela's position on the movie, but she's wrong about the glasses. Not seeing the ghosts wouldn't have helped the situation at all. The ghosts could still get you. I don't remember what your position was. <laughs> oh, I said that, like... If if you have to wear the glasses to see the ghost, just don't wear the glasses. Oh, yeah. But wearing the glasses didn't help them avoid getting attacked by the ghost at all. So I, to me, it just seems like a dumb, from an audience perspective, seems like a dumb gimmick of the movie. Well, That's several all. of the listeners wrote, us, wrote in to tell us that the, uh, the original film, they did wear glasses in the movie. Special glasses okay. in the original 1960s movie. Um, okay. Grant Paris says, uh, oh, about Shannon Elizabeth, who we were talking about, uh, everyone forgetting when she played Boo Boo Kitty Fuck and Jay and Silent Bob? Yeah, I uh, forgot. Yeah, yes. I mean, I don't really care about that <laughs> universe of movies, so yes. I think she reprised her role in the Kevin or Jay and Silent Bob reboot. There you go. Pretty sure she was back in that. Probably. <laughs> cool. 
Uh, Richard Pulfer, he said, I did like Matthew Lillard in this. I think his frenzied performance works well in this movie. I wouldn't be surprised if some of his dialogue was written by James Gunn, particularly the more meta parts like Lillard complaining that, go- that the ghosts wait until he's close to the cage to pull a jump scare. Yeah, because we said James Gunn did a ghost write on uh, 13 right. Ghosts. There you go. You got to go back and listen to our episode for the whole story. Um, so. Now we've come to the main event, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to go around the room. We're going to tell you what we individually thought of tonight's movie, Dread. We're Colin! Start- yeah, Sean. Colin, what, 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 did you, what did you think about Dread, the movie we watched tonight? Um, yeah, I mean... Don't hold back. Okay. Uh, ultimately, I liked it, and I would recommend it. Um, I, uh, I think... <sighs> I mean, I'm kind of, see, this is the thing. I, I, I know that there's like, there's, a, I mean, just based on the comments that we got, you know, everybody's saying that it's one of the greatest movies that they've seen, but best action movies. I guess I've never had that kind of experience with it. To me, it's like it's an above average uh, action movie where, you know, it kind of does occupy like the same place as like uh, Hellboy, the remake, which I didn't think that was as bad as everybody said it was, but uh, that's several steps below this. I think this is a, uh, it's a um, good, capable kind of, you know, lean action movie where basically, yeah, it is stripped down to like, you know, we're running through this building and we're blowing stuff up. Personally, I did prefer that. I think the raid is several steps uh, better than this one at the same concept, but that's only because they had this jaw dropping uh, sequence of uh, martial arts choreography throughout the whole thing. Like, they don't breathe in that movie. Yeah. And it's sequel, uh, the raid, um, what is that called? Just the raid two, right? Um, that one's less nonstop. That's just like they changed focus and became this epic. Like it's the uh, the the like the Indonesian Godfather with martial arts. Um, but yeah, Sold. I think you know. Ba- yeah, we we should watch those actually. Um, I think Carl Urban, like we were saying, I think he does sell this, and I think it's a difficult part uh, for an actor when you're just acting with your mouth and your chin. Uh, and so I got to give the guy a lot of credit for being committed to, you know, bearing most of his face in this helmet and the fact that he's able to convey, which we're pointing out, you know, a character arc for the character. Uh, that's an impressive piece of work. Um, judge dread is inscrutable. You know, I don't really know what makes him tick. Uh, I don't know if we're supposed to, he is just the paragon of, uh, justice, you know, justice is coming. It says, on the awesome poster for this movie, which I think, you know, I got to get and put it on my wall. It looks a lot like, uh, for some reason, it reminds me of the Attack the Block poster. Like, if you pulled back a little more and put a couple other guys up there on the... on the, I can see that. Yeah. You know, what it, you know what it looks like? It looks like the cover of Halo. Oh, it does kind yeah. of. It's exactly like the cover yeah, of Halo. Yeah, it does. Yeah, with the Master Chief. Which, like, yeah. what? Oh, didn't Alex Garland write the Halo movie that never got made? Did he? He might have. I believe he did. I think he was one of the writers on that, and then it never materialized. And that was going to be made, I believe, in South Africa by the guy who made District 9, that uh, Neil Blomkamp. Right. right? The guy who that. keeps on getting assigned to movies that never get made, like Alien 5 <laughs> or whatever it was. Um, right. Make something, dude. Make make RoboCop, make Alien 5. Make, just make did, was he involved in Chappie at all? Yeah, he, he made, made Chappie. Chappie. That's his third well, movie. That's what killed it. Yeah, there you go. Like, that's I mean, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> he makes a bunch of short films now. That's his whole. He made a production he does. company. He does that. Like oatmeal. I wish like, I could unsee Chappie. Yeah, it's horribly bad. <laughs> I hate that movie. Yeah, I hate it too. Hate, hate that movie. Um, I, I hate its attitude. I hate the attitude of that movie. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. God. Yeah. Reprehensible. Um, yeah. <laughs> Jesus. All right. I've never seen this movie. Yeah, and Hugh Jackman's in it. Poor guy. Um. I don't know, like, uh, I mean, as far as, like, criticism of the movie, um, it does everything well enough for, like, the, the, the level that it's going for, right? It delivers. You know, if you go into a movie, you buy a ticket for a movie called Dread, you want Judge Dread in it, you're going to get it with this. Uh, so I think, you know, you got to say, I recommend uh, Judge Dread. Check it out. Next, we're going to go to, let's go to Holly. Um. Yeah, no, I think I, I think I agree with a lot of what you were saying, Colin. You know, we had one of our listeners wrote in and said that it was a sleepy movie, and I think I understand what he was what he was going with there because the uh, 
a lot of people were saying that it's one of the greatest action movies recently. And I don't know that I would go that far. It's perfectly adequate. I think it checks all the boxes that you want from a movie of this caliber for sure. Like it gives you the violence, gives you the gore, it gives you action. It gives you, you know, the, the judge dread that you want. Um, it does deliver on all these things, you know, uh, no doubt about it. Lena Headey is a to- heady. Did we land on, is it heady or heady? I think it's heady. Whatever. Anyway, um, Cersei's great. And <laughs> <laughs> no, she's spectacular. She was her unfeeling just, she's great in everything she does. She can do no wrong. In my opinion, she's spectacular, but I just loved that character. She's just like this un because she really does mere j- dread. They're both these like unfeeling characters. And I, I like that, that yin and yang, but at the same time, like they were like the opposite, but the same. And I, I thought it worked really well. Um, no compromise. But yeah, I, the, that's what yeah, yeah, together, yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think there is a sleepiness about this movie. I don't think it's nonstop action. I think a lot of it is very forgettable. A lot of it, like I, you know, I don't know, I'd look down at my cat and look up and I was like, did nothing's really happened or like nothing like, I, I don't know. There's, there's just a lot of, there's just a lot of moments that just don't really move the movie along. And, you know, like you said, it's, it's in a stationary location. It's in one day. I don't know. There's, there's a lot about this that I understand what they're saying when they say it's a sleepy movie. Um, but that being said, you know, like I said, it's perfectly adequate in a lot of ways and it it checks all the boxes that you want from a movie of this, of this caliber. And I would, I'd still recommend it for sure. I don't know that I would, I don't know that it would be one of my go-tos that I'd go back and watch all the time, but I I would definitely recommend it. And I might watch it again at some point. Um, it was entertaining for sure. It's, it's a very beautiful movie. Like the, and, you know, even the C- normally I hate CGI special effects, like when it comes to gore and, and that kind of thing. Um, but in this, just the style of movie it is, it works. Um, it didn't bug me at all. Just it's a very pretty kind of CGI. And, you know, I assume in 3D, it's really gorgeous. Um, yeah, it, it, it works for what it is. So I definitely recommend Dread for sure. Uh, Sean, what did you think? Um, uh, I think we're, uh, you're all right here. I think this is a, uh, a solid B plus action movie, shoot 'em up. And that's all that it is. Not that's, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm saying it does that very well and that's yeah. all it needs to do. So, um, I'm going to be the one descending opinion about Lena Headey. I don't think she's great in this movie at all. I think she's pretty flat. How true. dare you? I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I know. Uh, I, I don't think she's really given a great performance in this movie. It's I, it's not detracting to the movie, from, I don't really think. But, yeah, it just kind of went. Do you want her to be, like, more mustache twirling? Because that seems like the only types of villains you really get into is, like, maybe. the really over-the-top mustache twirling. Maybe. Um, uh, maybe a little more of that. If she twirled the mustache every now and again, uh, I'd, it would have been better. But. See, yeah, that's how I felt about Carl Urban. I was like, I don't think he's doing anything in this. Like half a face, whole face. I don't, I mean, it's what he's given. So I'll give him that. But I was like, I don't give a shit. Like, I don't think he's doing anything. So, but he's, anyway, he's, go, ahead, go ahead. He's got his moments, but I, but I think they're, they're really just going for, um, just solid, uh, uh, a slightly above average action movie, which is like, there's some, sometimes that's all you need. And that hits a spot and you don't need any more than that. If that's what you're looking for, this movie's perfect for you. Um, yeah. I get the, the sleepy idea because a lot of it is just like, it is just constant shooting, moving your way up, constant shooting, moving your way up, uh, pointed by little moments of like cool character stuff with dread, like just minor moments and with, um, Anderson. Um, so there's not a, uh, even the end, it's just kind of, it's just, it's straight laced action movie. Um, so, uh, sometimes it's not a bad thing. Um, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't go above and beyond that. I don't think it tries though. I think it knows what it wants to do. I think it's exactly what it wants to be. And I think sometimes that that's enough. So again, it's not, uh, one of the greatest action movies of all time. Definitely not. Um, I even would take a break before going back and watching this again, but I Hmm. did like it. Um, uh, and I was entertained by it. Uh, so I am going to recommend it. Uh, I did have a good time. It is again, just your straight laced B plus action movie, solid double up the middle. Uh, I recommend it. Watch Dread. Maybe uh, maybe 3D. Like if you're gonna like if you haven't watched it yet and you can do that one time, 
like do it in 3D and like get that full experience and then you should be good. So, but I recommend it. Michaela. Yeah, I think this is the only movie I've ever watched that I thought, man, I wish I would have seen that in 3D. I don't think I've ever thought that about another movie before. And this movie just uses it in a way that makes so much more sense than like pretty much any other movie out there. Uh, it's the first time I saw this, I didn't really know what to expect. And I kind of really low expectations, especially since, you know, like I said, this is right around total recall and RoboCop reboots that were both really bad. Like that total recall one, I think I watched before I watched this and I was like, Oh, that was so boring and just so bad. And, and then that, that movie, I was like, is Colin Farrell a leading man? Why do we keep doing this? I was kind of like, you know, maybe this isn't his thing, <laughs> but this movie, I really love how gory it is. I love that it doesn't hold back on any of that. I love that this is an action movie for adults. This is a hard R-rated action movie. And I appreciate that. And I appreciate that it doesn't, like, as pretty as it is and as and then, like as beautiful as the effects are, they're really unique looking because, like, like I said, psychedelic is really the only way I can describe it. It feels very acid trippy the way things kind of happen and the way they move and the way they're colored. But I... I was pleasantly surprised the first time I saw this movie. This is my second time watching it, and I enjoy it just as much as I did the first time. I I I disagree, Sean. I think Lena Headey is amazing, and I love her in this. And like, <laughs> I just hope that she continues to have a career like this going forward. Um, I mean, I, I understand your guys' criticism. So maybe you. This is your guys' first Sean and Holly's first time watching it, so maybe that's why you're feeling that way. Whereas Colin and I have seen it before. But I yeah, I gotta recommend it. It's it's awesome. I I love I love this type of movie and I I feel like this is like purely for adults and I feel like we don't really get action movies like this anymore. And yeah, every villain has to be mustache twirling or have like a weird thing. Like I kind of think about the current James Bond movies and like how ridiculous those villains are and how they have to have like a weird tick or something. And in this she's just like very chill very in control and very confident about every choice she's making. And I don't feel like I see that in a lot of action movies anymore. So I'm definitely going to recommend dread. I think you absolutely have to watch it. If you get the chance to watch it in 3d, definitely do that. It is absolutely worth it, but yes, hard recommend. All right. So that's uh, four. Yeah. Four, four positives for dread. So I guess I mean, you, you have to see it now. Right? <laughs> yeah, I mean that's the law, right? Yeah. That's the rule. That's the rule. And who and I was like, and who is the law? <laughs> I, I am the law. There you go. <laughs> 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 All right. So uh I'm gonna have to bring up the <laughs> Skype window. When do we so, get off this show, I'm just gonna yell at you guys in, in Stallone for an hour. Law. maybe yeah. Schwarzenegger too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm missing all this because I'm the only one who can't see the Skype window when we do these. I'm looking at the waveform. Uh, so I'm going to have to check out and see what Sean's doing with the Stallone impersonation there. All right. So next week, uh, we're going to watch a movie that's chosen by uh, Colin, right? Yes. Colin, yes. Next week. Colin, what are we watching next week? All right. Week? So we're probably, I'm using this movie to have a larger conversation, but next week, Uh-oh. we're going to watch Not Resident there. Evil uh, Apocalypse. Hi. Uh, Fuck you. <laughs> <God damn it. laughs> you know what, Colin? You're doing all the talking on this one. This is this is the second one, right? With Nemesis. This, yeah, yeah, with the Nemesis. Okay. Because okay. I've been playing my PlayStation is basically all it has is Resident Evil games on it. So we're gonna talk about <laughs> Resident I'm Evil. Just there. Just, there. You what? I can say this right now. I've never watched Resident Evil. I've never played it. I know nothing about it. Well, you're not going to learn shit from this movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like these follow any sort of lore. <laughs> well, there's like, there's two, tri- oh, there's a whole thing. Okay, so yeah. next week. This is the last one that follows any lore. This, uh, yeah. So uh, next week, Resident Evil Apocalypse. I know that was out of left field. Um, so we're going to do yeah. that. And until then, ladies and germs, the basement is going dark. <laughs>